we left last time talking about protein deficiency, and we said in our Western countries it's not really common, it's not a problem, because we already have more than enough protein, so uh, even if we don't have a perfectly balanced diet, we will have deficiencies of maybe other nutrients, vitamins and minerals, but generally not proteins. Um, however, uh, there are some, at least in the long term, that is. There are, however, some segments of the population that even in our uh, post-industrialized rich countries and you know, North America, Europe, may have uh, uh, problems of protein deficiency. Pro uh, poverty is definitely a problem because uh, uh, they just may not be getting enough food in general and you know, high quality protein food are generally also the most expensive. And then uh, the elderly uh, may have problems and again, uh, economic issues may be uh, an issue, but also they may just, especially if they live alone, uh, maybe not be motivated to eat, to cook for themselves, maybe they have trouble chewing or swallowing, uh, their taste is different, so they may very well not enjoy eating and therefore not uh, having adequate calories and proteins. And many times you don't realize that until for some other reason they uh, go to the hospital and then they find out that they are actually malnourished. And the family didn't realize, they said, you know, uh, we thought grandma was doing just fine on her own, but actually she was not. Uh, alcoholism, <clears throat> you know, alcohol is not a nutrient because it doesn't really do anything good for us, but um, it provides calories, a lot of them actually, seven calories per gram, so more than proteins and carbohydrates, almost as much as fat. So if you drink a lot of alcohol, and it also suppresses appetite, so very likely you will not be hungry and you will not be eating enough. And so you'll be missing a bunch of nutrients, including proteins. <clears throat> eating disorders, this is another problem in our uh, societies and you will have very interesting lectures from your TAs, Brie and Rachel, on eating disorders, but definitely anorexia nervosa can uh, carry also problems of just not getting enough proteins together with everything else. And hospitalization also, because you remember uh, when you are ill or when you're recovering, your protein needs can be way, way higher than average. And in the hospital, sometimes, you know, uh, generally diet is not always the primary concern of the medical team because they are there to, you know, save your life likely for something else. So diet may not be the first concern. And uh, so you may not get enough proteins. This is actually a problem. That's the reason why you want to registered dietitians to be there specifically thinking about getting you enough uh, nutrients. And it's not much of a problem here in the US, but where I come from, from Italy, the dietitian in the hospital is really completely, uh, generally belittled by the inflated ego of the physician that thinks he knows best and that the dietitian should just be in the kitchen as some sort of upgraded cook. Um, it is, however, a problem long-term protein deficiency in um, developing countries. And here you have a double problem. You don't ha have enough food, uh, so not enough access to enough proteins, but also uh, you have problems of food safety. So uh, you may be getting infections, you may be fighting parasite infections from the food you eat, from the contaminated water that you drink, and so now your protein needs are also higher than average, or you're not getting enough. And so this just creates uh, more problems. And children are, of course, at higher risk for this because they are growing, and in general, they are just more uh, vulnerable to this pro problem of protein deficiency. Um, and generally, uh, if you are not getting enough proteins that many times means you're also just not getting enough food in general, so also not enough calories, not enough energy. And, and which is the reason why we refer to this problem of pro protein malnutrition generally as protein calorie malnutrition. So many times you're not getting enough proteins and you're not getting enough calories as well. The consequences of not getting enough proteins are if you are growing, uh, your growth will be impaired or stunted or even severely stunted. You will have a low weight for your age, so it will not be 
adequate to what it should be for your age, even severely inadequate, it can be, uh, you know, 50% of what it, it should be. Your height will be inappropriate for your age. If you are developing your brain, it will not be able to fully develop, so you will have problems of mental retardation that can sometimes be irreversible. And even if you're not growing, um, protein turnover will slow down anyway. So this is a problem for adults as well. You will not be able to carry on with all those metabolic functions of, of proteins. You will have problems of muscle wasting. You will start stealing proteins from your muscle um, to make carbohydrate, to make glucose, to make energy. And so you will, when you start losing more and more muscle, you will have muscle weakness. You will not eventually be even able to do the most simple things like walking. And you will have inadequate tissue repair. Remember, we need protein to maintain all the tissues that are constantly broken down. Protein needs to be replaced. If we do not have protein, this cannot happen. So eventually, you will have damage in all of your organs. But then also, you remember that <clears throat> protein are necessary for immunity because our antibodies are proteins. And now, you will not have enough to fight infections, viruses, bacteria, disease, and you will maybe very well die from that disease. And remember, again, in a developed country, this is a problem. They have more need for this because they have to keep fighting all those infections and parasites infection, problems with uh, food safety, unsafe water, contaminated water, contaminated food. Now, there is a whole range of uh, different degrees of protein and protein energy malnutrition, but sort of the tip of the iceberg of uh, undernutrition are two conditions that uh, are quashior core and marasmus. I keep hitting the wrong keyboard. Quashior core is uh, primarily a disease of protein deficiency. So here, protein uh, is not enough. You may be getting enough energy, not necessary, but you may be getting enough energy because likely your diet is uh, primarily cereals. And uh, your core is a word from Ghana that means, uh, so they tell me, the disease that the child gets when the next child is born. And this is because then the old child switches from a breastfeeding to a diet that is likely inadequate in proteins because it's mainly cereals. And granted, we do not need a lot of protein, so even on cereal diet, we would probably get enough, but uh, many times this is combined with pre-existing infections. So again, they do not get a lot of proteins, but their need for protein is dramatically higher because they have to fight infections. And now they are definitely not getting enough. Um, they may have uh, still some uh, fat tissue, some muscle, but the characteristic sign of your core is the swollen abdomen, which you can see there. And that is definitely not fat. It, it's, it's due to these two causes that you see there. Um, edema, uh, abdominal edema that is called ascites, but it's basically you know, the same mechanisms that we saw last time for how protein maintains fluid balance. You do not have enough proteins in your bloodstream, low albumin, then all this fluid will start leaking. And you can see there it has edema in the foot. But kind of the same thing happens in the abdominal cavity as well. So that's fluid building up. And also problems with fat liver that can contribute to that uh, dramatic you know, aspect of quash your core. And if you think back to your lipids, you can understand why that happens. Your, your liver uh, can make lipids starting from carbohydrates. Uh, and then it has to send, it, send them around, but before it can do that, it has to package them into the lipoproteins because uh, lipids cannot go into the bloodstream by themselves because they're not water soluble. But now if you do not have proteins, you cannot make the lipoproteins, and so these lipids will never be able to even leave the liver, and so they will just start accumulating and the liver doesn't really know what to do with it. And so that's why you will also have fat liver on top of everything else that you have. Marasmus, now we have a full protein and energy deficiency. So here you're not only getting not enough proteins, but also not enough carbs, not enough lipids, not enough anything. You're just not eating enough. You're starving. 
And so this is uh, a complete wasting uh, of, of body tissues. Most metabolic processes will slow down. Um, growth will be severely stunted, less than 60% of the normal weight for age. It will start losing weight, muscle, fat, bones. So general wasting of body tissues, severely higher risk for infection and disease and, and death resulting from, from this disease. And basically all that's left is skin and bones. Uh, so no muscle, uh, no fat tissue. Okay, so now we saw about when proteins is not enough. Now we go on the other end of the range when we actually have too many proteins. So high protein diets, looks familiar, that's you. Uh, well, not, not really you, you, certainly not after this class. But indeed, the uh, North American diet is higher in protein than what we need. We say more than the 0.8 that we need in, on average is 1.2, then it's not easy to estimate how, how many proteins, but definitely more than what we need, which is already the recommended intake higher than the actual need for most people. So the average US diet exceeds protein needs, but when we refer to high protein diets, uh, we do not refer to the slightly, high, uh, the slightly higher protein intake that all of us more or less have. We refer to way higher protein intakes. It can be two grams per kilo per day, three grams, four grams per kilo per day, and there's mainly two situations of segments of the population that may have way higher protein intakes. Can be many weight loss diet or high protein diet. High protein diet make you lose weight fast. Um, not as fast, we know, as high lipids diet. But also remember what we said last time, a lot of this weight will actually be just water. Remember, you, you flush out water to catabolize all that nitrogen from proteins. Um, and then you will deplete your glycogen, you get rid of another lot of water. Which, I mean, it's not necessarily bad, but it's not good either. Sometimes you can get some motivation out of seeing that it's starting to work, but uh, it's, it's water. Um, and athletes and bodybuilders, you know, they want to build new muscle, so there's this conception that you need a lot of protein to build a lot of muscle. And again, we, we said it is indeed true, but you really do not need a lot. So what the protein you get from your average diet is already enough. For uh, the muscle you can possibly build, there is a physiological limit to the amount of muscle you can build per day. And to cover that, you know, 10 extra grams of protein will be enough even for the most uh, motivated of the bodybuilders. So when you get all the, the extra protein, what do you do with that? Uh, well, we know that our body cannot store proteins or amino acids for later use, remember, so we cannot even say, well, okay, I don't need them today, but I'll just save them for tomorrow. You cannot. Uh, you need to use them, and if you do not need them for anything else, one of these two things will happen. If you need energy, well, then you, you use this extra protein for energy production. And this is the case of athletes. So they get all these excess protein, they just use them as an energy source in place of carbs and fat, that, that's fine. But uh, if you do not need them for energy because you're sedentary, uh, then uh, you uh, have nothing else to do with these proteins than converting them to fat and then store them in your adipose tissue. And a typical uh, real life situation is the athletes that, for some reason, at some point, will stop exercising. So, you know, life, life takes over, the family, the work, you, you cannot exercise anymore. But most of the time, we'll keep eating the same way he was eating before. So now, all that extra protein that before it was just burning, now it will convert them to fat. It will go to the other end of the slide, and within a couple of months, it will see his belly growing and he says, you see what happens when I stopped exercising. But really the problem is not that you stopped exercising, but that you kept eating as if you were still exercising. And so now all the excess protein, you're not burning anymore. Are there any concerns to very high protein diet? Uh, there's some that sometimes are brought up and let's examine them quickly. The, Typical concern is that you will overburden your liver and kidneys because you remember the uh, biochemical pathways to catabolize proteins. You need to 
uh, take out ammonia, which is toxic, so the liver has to make urea, and then the kidneys has to excrete it. Uh, and so the early nutrition books would conclude for, from this uh, biochemical fact that somehow your liver and kidneys would get tired or even damaged from doing this on the long term. But actually, really, uh, the truth of the matter is they don't. We have studies with athletes eating insanely high amount of protein for extended periods of time, and their liver and kidneys don't really care. They are perfectly equipped to deal with protein catabolism if they are healthy. Now, if they are not, so if you have liver disease or kidney disease, then you would certainly not want to exceed uh, your protein needs. It can be a problem of excess calories. Uh, like we said before, you may simply just getting too many and so have no use for them and therefore uh, deposit them as fat. And again, this is not a concern for athletes. They are burning their proteins. It may be a problem of excess animal products. Now, for most people, going on a high-protein diet most of the time means just eating meat or animal food, and we, which is bad not for the protein, but for everything else. You're likely getting a lot of saturated fat. And you likely have a diet that is low in fiber. Your uh, gut uh, microbiota will change in a way that's less favorable, putting you at a higher risk for uh, colon cancer risk. And again, for athletes, this is not generally a problem because when they go on high-protein diet, that's generally from isolated protein, like the typical protein shake. That's just proteins. But for common people, high-protein diets, they will eat a lot of animal food. There is also a kidney stones formation concern, which is really minor concern because it affects a really small percent of the population, so it's very rare. Dehydration is another possible concern for the same reason. Remember, high protein, you lose a lot of water. Now, if you lose a lot of water and you, you're not getting enough, you're not drinking enough, that may be a concern, but again, it's really a minor concern. You generally, uh, hopefully, get enough water. Now, the one concern that I think is indeed of concern is this. Uh, you will increase your urinary excretion of calcium. We know that when you go on a high-protein diet, you, you flush out a lot of calcium. And we're not exactly sure why this happens, but very likely it is because to catabolize amino acids, and especially the sulfur-containing amino acids, um, thiamine and cysteine, uh, you will generate some acids, sulfuric acid, that needs to be buffered. The kidneys normally will do that, but if you have a lot, it's probably not enough. And so you need to steal some calcium from your bones to buffer these acids, make salts, and then flush them out. And so you will excrete this calcium. So if you do this on the long term, you'll likely have problem of calcium depletion and so risk of uh, osteoporosis and bones fractures. And um, here's when I bring up this problem. I mean, you don't have to write this down if you don't want, because it's not in your book, but just keep in mind that uh, milk and dairy are in definitely good sources of calcium, as everybody probably tells you, but only until protein needs are met for this very reason. Now, if you start drinking liters of milk and tons of cheese because you think it's good for your bones, um, it's, you are very wrong, because if you go above and beyond your needs, then you'll start to have to steal calcium from your bones to buffer these acids. And milk is rich in sulfur-containing amino acids. So you may very well go in a situation of negative calcium balance, uh, so the, the, the calcium you're bringing in with milk is less than the one you're flushing out. So the, the net loss is loss. And we have some epidemiological studies from the Harvard School of Public Health that actually show that the women with the highest consumption of milk are also the group with the highest incidence of bone fractures. But in general, we can conclude that exceeding protein needs is unnecessary because we already get plenty from our average diet, but for athletes at least is not a major concern. They just use these proteins for energy. Uh, and even for the bones, you know, uh, resistance training, bodybuilding is so good for your bones that it will more than compensate any possible issue with calcium. 
However, for a sedentary individual now, uh, long-term excess protein can be indeed be detrimental for all the reasons we saw. It's a lot of excess calories, it's a lot of animal products, and it will likely increase your, or your calcium excretion. Sometimes you also want to get some individual amino acid supplements and... Go back. Sorry? Go back. I can. Should I? Okay, so the branched chain amino acids are the usual uh, amino acid supplements that you may get. They are uh, leucine, isoleucine, and valine. Uh, they are called branched because in their side chain they have branched carbon skeleton. And if you remember, we mentioned last time they are the ones that are preferentially used by your muscle when your glycogen stores are depleted because you do a prolonged exercise, so you need amino acids for energy. And for this reason, they are marketed as, you know, uh, amino acids for sports, um, which again you likely not need, you, you get enough from diet. Um, there are uh, also other possible individual amino acid supplements uh, for specific functions, you know, to sleep better, to some free hormonal functions. Tryptophan is sometimes sold by itself. Now, the, the, the biggest problem with these uh, single amino acids, aside from the fact that they are very expensive, and they taste horribly. Uh, frankly, they are disgusting. But the problem is that they may alter absorptive mechanisms in your small intestine. Uh, amino acids, they often share the same carrier as far as absorption. So they, they kind of all have to go through the same door to be absorbed. Now, if you have large excess of just one or a few, chances are then, then the other will not be absorbed efficiently because they will be lost in between all these excess of just one or a few amino acids. And so you may have impaired uh, absorption of the essential amino acids you need. Lastly, we want to examine vegetarian and vegan diet. Uh, oh, let's do a quick survey. Are there some vegetarians here? Can you raise your hand? A few. Some vegan? One. Okay, that's good. Um, okay, so we saw um, there are some advantages and disadvantages in eating animal products. The main advantage for all of them is it's high quality protein. The advantage for meat is also it will give you some vitamin B12, some well absorbable iron, um, some other vitamins and minerals. The main problem are it will also get you a lot of saturated fat that's not exactly healthy, um, especially red meat. It will carry some toxins, some stress uh, toxins from the animal, the way it is raised, the way it is slaughtered. Cooking protein uh, generates some carcinogenic substances, well, high, high temperature cooking. Some additives, sometimes using preserved meat, such nitrates, are carcinogenic. And then again, for uh, multiple reasons, and primarily because of the changes in your um, gut bacteria, you will also have increased colon cancer risk from high uh, meat consumption. Fish is also a good source of high quality protein. It also has all of those nice uh, omega-3 fatty acids. Um, that you need, but uh, if, you, if you remember what's the worst thing ever that can happen to a polyunsaturated fat is that it gets oxidized. Now, un unless you eat your fish raw or very gently cooked, steamed, but if you cook fish at high temperatures, a lot of those good fatty acids will get oxidized, and now uh, when you oxidize a polyunsaturated fatty acid, it don't not only does it lose its function, it also becomes detrimental. Mercury is another concern. Um, it is a toxic, uh, heavy metal. Uh, it bioaccumulates in fish. Uh, and in general, pollution. We live in a 
there's pollution in the oceans, in the sea, and the fish, whatever is there, it will bioaccumulate and then you will eat it. Which is the reason why we say that, yes, you should eat fish, but you probably do not want to eat more than two or three servings per week. Um, milk and dairy, again, high quality protein. They are sources of calcium, but they also contain uh, saturated, some trans fatty acids. And the saturated fatty acids in milk are also the ones that we really do not want. Um, like we said before, we have this problem if you start drinking a lot and a lot of milk and dairy, you may have problems of actually losing calcium. There are other concerns about links between milk consumption and diabetes because of a possible pro-inflammatory effect of casein, which is the most abundant protein in milk. Uh, and I put a question mark there because there's a lot of debate right now on milk. You know, should we drink it? Not here in the US, but in Europe, there's a lot of debate. So there's fighting uh, teams of people pro and against. And in general, there's also other concerns um, uh, associated with animal food consumption that are not stri strictly nutritional or health related, but um, it is an economically inefficient protein source, as you probably have heard. You know, you could feed 10 people with plant products instead of just one with meat because you have to give that 10 servings to the cow so that, that you can have your meat. Um, you have uh, the environmental impact of farming. Uh, many times, you know, the big uh, farms cattle or poultry and also fish, they are sort of environmental nightmares. They produce a lot of waste products and gases. Um, animal well-being can be a concern for some, uh, and if you think about it, you know, many times, it, it's really, really, they live really a sad life, these farm-raised animals. Animal sacrifice is a problem for other people. They say, you know, I don't want to kill anybody to feed myself. Um, the pollution of fish stock, we thought that the oceans could be like plenty and infinite sources of fish, but we are finding out they're actually not. We are fishing already more than nature is able to replace. Um, and then religion can also be the reason why many people choose to go on vegan or vegetarian diet. And so now the question is, can we safely go on a vegan or a vegetarian diet and still get all the nutrients we need, be healthy, prevent disease, not have any deficiencies? And the answer is, sure we can, but we have to be careful uh, to some aspects. And now let's just define the difference for those of you who maybe do not know. A vegan diet is a diet that completely excludes all sources of animal uh, food. So you will just eat cereals and legumes, fruits and vegetables, nuts and seeds, seaweeds, algae, and alternative protein sources as long as they are uh, not animal. And then a vegetarian diet also will include some other food sources as long as you don't, do not kill any animal. So you can have a lacto-vegetarian that will eat all these things and milk and dairy. Ovo-vegetarian, so all the vegan food plus eggs. Lacto-ovo-vegetarian, so dairy and eggs. We also have fruitarian that uh, are even more strict and they only primarily eat fruit and nuts and this is nutritionally definitely not adequate because you will end up missing some nutrients. And it is interesting in your book it mentions that fruitarian will eat fruits and nuts and honey. Now as far as I know honey is a typical animal product because it's made from bees and they are not happy that you keep stealing this honey and they have to start from scratch every time. So as far as I know vegan people, do, do you eat honey? <laughs> Okay, she's not vegan. Okay. Um, am I green lighted to go on? Um, so, what are the uh, advantages of, of? Let's focus on a vegan diet. Um, well, uh, high fiber is definitely an advantage. Uh, as you know, uh, the average U.S. diet it is not even remotely close to meet fiber needs. But also keep in mind that time is needed to adjust. I don't know what that is. Time needed to adjust. Um, uh, because if you just go from low fiber to high fiber, then you will have some troubles absorbing micronutrients and vitamins and minerals, you will have some discomfort, so you definitely want to work your gut up to a high fiber uh, diet, but then it's fine. 
It will be a diet that is low in saturated and trans fat. It will have no cholesterol at all. Uh, you remember cholesterol is only an animal uh, um, molecule, so you will have no cholesterol in any vegetable product, not even oil. It will be a low caloric density, so you will be full with less energy. And sometimes this can actually be a problem. And if you think people that are not very hungry, children maybe that are very easily satiated, uh, so they may be full before they get enough nutrients and calories. And now for them, you will need some high energy vegan food. But for most of the people, this is a good thing. You will definitely get plenty of phytochemicals with uh, cancer, fa cancer fighting, cancer preventive, uh, cardiovascular preventive, heart healthy uh, molecules. So we will have protection against cardiovascular disease and cancer. And you remember, those are the two leading causes of death in our uh, post-industrialized countries. Cardiovascular disease number one, uh, cancer is number two. Diabetes is number three. And guess what? We will also have better glucose and insulin control on a, a vegan diet because many reasons, but think all that fiber that avoids insulin peaks, as long as uh, you eat whole grain cereals. Of course, if you eat refined cereals, then you do, not, you do not have any good glucose control. Refined cereals is just starch, and just starch uh, will, you know, digestive enzymes will jump on that starch and make glucose in five minutes. And so it's just as eating sugar from the sugar bowl. But whole grain cereals. Um, very careful diet planning is required, however, and this is, uh, you know, the primary concern of a vegan diet. If on an omnivore diet you can sometimes, you know, eat whatever and because you're distracted, it's not what you want to do, but you'll not get in much trouble. You want to be very, very careful on a vegan diet that you make everything right so that you do not have any deficiencies and you get all the nutrients you need. Do we have any concerns for energy? No, we do not. We get plenty of carbohydrates and lipids from plant food. Lipids are also good quality lipids. We get our monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fatty acids. So unless for those people who do not eat a lot, the children that may have, you know, not get enough energy because they are full very soon, you get plenty of energy from plant source food. There is, however, one little problem. You remember that you one, your omega-3, EPA and DHA, and you find those in fish. So what if you do not eat fish? Uh, well, the key here is you get uh, alpha-linolenic uh, omega-3 fatty acids that is a precursor of EPA and DHA. It's not as efficient, but you can get enough if you eat walnuts and flax seeds that are the primary source of uh, alpha-linolenic. You can have flax seeds oil, but it's very easily oxidized, so you probably want to uh, go for the flax seeds and you want to chew them very, very carefully because otherwise they will just go through your gastrointestinal tract intact and you will not get anything out of them. There are some seaweeds that are rich in DHA or you can go for the supplements. Any concern from protein quality? We know that, yes, plant sources of protein are generally low quality protein, but we also know that we can very easily complement them, so eating them together. The Academy for Nutrition and Dietetics has a position statement on vegan diets where they say that you do not even need to obsess about uh, complement protein sources in the same meal, so it's fine as long as you do it over the course of the day. Um, and so you don't have to worry about that. How about vitamins? And, well, you already have to probably study vitamins, but they, this is sort of a sneak peek, and then everything will be uh, you know, used later. Vitamin A is definitely an animal vitamin. Um, but we also have a uh, precursor that's beta carotene that we find in carrots and other orange uh, you know, fruits and vegetables. So we can make vitamin A starting from beta-carotene, so we are fine. 
even on a ve uh, vegan diet. Vitamin D is also animal only, but guess what? We are one of the animals that can make vitamin D. So starting from cholesterol, we can build vitamin D in our skin if we are exposed to uh, sunlight for 15 minutes a day. Um, however, uh, if you live in Maine, uh, you're not exposed to a lot of sun, and even if there's sun, you're like not getting it because you're dressed up because it's freezing cold, or you may have darker uh, skin, or you may never go out. So now you're probably not building enough vitamin D yourself, and you probably want to go for some fortified foods, breakfast cereals, milk, or supplements to make sure you get all the vitamin D you need. <coughs> vitamin B12 is another big concern. Now, vitamin Bs in general are, not all of them are frequent in plant-based food, but if you eat a variety of different food, brewer's yeast and green leafy vegetables, you, you get all of them, except this one. That's really animal only. And it is present on plant-based food only if it's there because of contamination from bacteria, or it's not a nice thought, but fecal contamination, if you think, is kind of inevitable in the food chain. And that's the reason why most vegan people can go on for years without any problem of, of vitamin B12 deficiency. But to be safe, and because vitamin B12 deficiency is a really serious issue, because it has serious neurological consequences, and because the symptoms of vitamin B12 deficiency anemia are not evident in a vegan diet because you get, they are masked by folate that you get plenty from vegetables, you probably want to be safe and go for some fortified foods or a cycle of supplements every one in a, in a while. Or if you take your uh, multivitamin, multimineral, uh, you already get all the vitamin B12 you need. As far as minerals are concerned, iron is sometimes considered a problem. But again, because uh, yes, iron in animal products is more absorbable, but it's also not a lot. And for most of us, most of the iron we get, we actually get it from plant-based food anyway. There's a lot of iron in whole grains. Well, there's not a lot, but we eat a lot. Um, nuts, legumes. Vitamin C enhances iron absorption, so if you squeeze a little bit of lemon juice in your water, you absorb even more. <coughs> Iodine can be a problem, but there's a lot of it in seaweeds, and you can also get it from iodized salt, but, you know, in general, you do not want to get a lot of salt added to your food, and you do not want to feel bad, because then you're missing the iodine. Zinc. Again, you can get zinc from whole grains, uh, nuts and legumes. Yes, there is a lot of fiber. It will somehow decrease your zinc absorption, but again, your gut will eventually adjust and will be able to get all the zinc and the other minerals you need in between that fiber. And finally, calcium. Um, again, for most of us anyway, the best sources of calcium are vegetables. Uh, so whole grains, green leafy vegetables, and tofu, not because there's any calcium in soy, but because the way it's processed, it's with calcium carbonate, so then it will have some, uh, she's basically chalk. Uh, you will have some calcium left in tofu. So in conclusion, we can say that a well-planned vegan diet can indeed be nutritionally adequate and also promote health and prevent chronic disease, prevent cardiovascular disease, prevent cancer. But very careful diet planning is required in order for you not to miss any of the essential nutrients and the energetic nutrients. 
Variety is key to meet nutritional needs, so you certainly do not want to focus on specific foods and eat always the same thing. You want to go for the whole range of fruits and vegetables and cereals and legumes and all that. And, well, if you have nothing against it, probably, just to be safe, a daily multivitamin, multimineral supplement may be advisable. It certainly doesn't hurt. It may help, and it help you, you know, cover all your needs for those very important uh, vitamins and minerals that you need. And this concludes our protein chapter, so if you do not have any questions, we are done. Thank you for your attention.